Good morning. <laughs> You're welcome this morning to the service. Uh, we know that uh, it's a bit cold and rainy, but uh, thank you for coming. Really appreciate. We know that the Lord is with us. Yes, he has promised to be with us. He said where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. And uh, today we have a guest speaker, Keith Underhill, preach to us in the morning as well as in the evening at 6.30 on Zoom. If you want to join us on Zoom, please let us know. We'll give you the login details and you'll be able to join us. And special welcome to those who are watching uh, us from, uh, on YouTube and Facebook. A special welcome to you. The Lord bless you as we gather together. I'll read uh, a scripture as we start in Isaiah chapter number 40, just some verses there. Isaiah chapter number 40. From verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely, the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the, our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as, uh, as his counselor has taught him. With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him in the path of justice. Who taught him knowledge. And showed him the way of understanding. Verse 21. Have you not known? And have you not heard? Has it not been taught from you, uh, you from the beginning? Have you not understood? from the foundations of the earth. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princess to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted, scarcely shall they be no sown, scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he, he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Have you, uh, why do you say, O oh, Jacob, speak, O oh, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? 
the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The first song we're going to sing is Behold Our God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We behold you, O God, in your word that reveals to us who you are, your character, your power, your greatness, your glory, your grace, your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that we are here gathered together in your name. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. You've given us strength to come together 
and honor you as, and hear your word explained to us. So we do pray, Lord, that you may be with us in this service. We do ask that you may um, open our hearts to hear your word explained to us and open our minds to understand what is said and be able to apply it in our lives. So we do thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit who ministers to us, who explains your word to us. And we thank you for the presence of one another, the gathering together of the saints in the presence of the Almighty God. Even as you have said, Lord, that when a two or three are gathered in your blessed name, there you are in their midst. So we are confident that you are present with us. And you are also present with our friends who are watching us uh, via, uh, uh, via, via the internet. So we pray, Lord, that you may minister to us as well as you minister to those who are watching us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we we'll sing the next hymn. Um, 10,000 reasons but all of us know that there are more than 10,000 reasons that we have to give thanks to the Lord 10,000 reasons they remain seated for this one
pray together. Yes, Lord, there are more than 10,000 reasons to give you thanks and praise. You've given us breath in our nostrils that we may worship and honor you. We thank you for who you are, the God of heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We thank you, Lord, that you are, you are who you are and there's no one like you. You are the great God, the great King above all gods. We thank you, Lord, that nothing compares with you, like the scriptures have said. You are who you are. We are so grateful, Lord. We recognize that the heavens declare your glory. The firmament shows forth your handiwork. And day after day they utter speech, and night after night they reveal knowledge. There's no language or speech where the voice is not heard. Their sound is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. We thank you for your greatness, your power and your glory, which you have shown and displayed in the universe. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And O oh God, you have you have ordained praise in the mouths of babes and infants. When we consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have made, who is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you take thought of him? And yet you have made him a little lower that the angels have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, and everything that passes through the sea. O oh Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Lord, even in the midst of the pandemic where we are confused and we don't know what's happening, where we are lambasted in every, from every side, you are supreme, you are sovereign, you are transcendent, and you are God, and there is no other. Nothing, oh God, catches you by surprise. All our circumstances are in your hands. We thank you, Lord, that uh, the, the, you are omnipresent. You are everywhere present. Here in Dovecot, in other places where they are worshipping you. In Africa, in America, in Asia, in, in Europe, in the islands of the ocean. You are God and there is no other. Father, we thank you. You have searched our hearts and you have known us. Lord, you know when we sit down and when we rise up. You understand our thoughts from afar. You comprehend our path and our lying down and you are acquainted with all our ways. Even before a word is on our tongue, Lord, behold, you know it all together. You've beset us behind and before and you've laid your hand upon us. Oh, such knowledge is too wonderful for us. Lord, we thank you. Where can we go from your presence? Where can we flee from your spirit? If we ascend into heaven, you are there. If we sit, if we make our bed in shell, behold, you are there. You are omnipresent. You are everywhere present. And you care. We thank you so much, Lord. And we pray, Father God, for that reason. For all our friends who are afflicted in body, in mind, and in any other way that you may stretch your hand of healing and stretch your hand of presence in their lives. We particularly pray for those who come to this congregation, Father, who are afflicted in body and in mind. Father, we pray that you may remember them in this affliction. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace that is sufficient for all of us uh, and, and your, your power which is made perfect in our weakness. We praise you, Father, for grace by grace we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves but is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast we thank you O oh God for the gospel that has been preached to us as we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and have come to the saving knowledge of our Lord so we do pray this morning as your gospel your word is preached father it will come with power with sincerity with conviction that you all, by your spirit, you convict men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. 
You instruct us in the way that we should go for your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, we pray that our minds will be open to hear your word and understand what is preached and explained this morning. We're so grateful, Lord, because we know that your word is forever settled in heaven. It shall not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which it's been sent. And so we pray for the preacher this, mo this morning. Then may help him, Father. He is just a man of clay. But we pray for the, inherent, if the, the inherence of the word of God to be expressed through the lips of clay by the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. We do ask in the name of Jesus because we know that you are the only hope for us, Lord. You're the only hope for our congregation. You're the only hope for humanity. You're the only hope for this, king, for, for this country. You're the only hope for this world. And Father, in the midst of confusion, you command peace in our hearts. So we do pray, Father, this morning, as we uh, sit under the sound of your word, that we may hear the voice of God beyond the voice of man. We thank you, Father, for these words. And so we do pray that in all these things, you may be glorified. Be glorified, O oh God. Be glorified, ancient of days. Be glorified, Alpha and Omega, first and last, beginning and end. Be glorified, Jehovah, Makadesh, our God. Be glorified in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, uh, before the preacher comes, we'll, we'll listen to another hymn. This time we're going to stand. Uh, see what a morning. I know this is Christmas time. You might have expected a Christmas carol. But uh, I, wanna, I want us to fast forward to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the baby was born in a manger and the son was given. But we know that the son grew up, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, buried, and on the third day, he rose again to be our salvation. So let's stand and sing in our hearts this song.
Uh, good morning to you. It's a privilege to be with you this morning to worship the Lord together. I'd like you to turn to Paul's letter to the Philippians and chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 12. After the usual introductions and thanksgiving and prayer for the church, Paul gets down to business in verse 12 of chapter 1. Let's hear the word of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. We're going to ask the question this morning and this evening and a couple of weeks' time, God willing, what do you do when your plans fail? Surely there's been no year like 2020 when all our plans have failed and it's been a time of great spiritual challenge to every one of us. The pandemic and the restrictions, the lockdowns, they've taken centre stage in our life. I don't need to tell you that, you know that. But the challenge is and the danger is that we come to think that the priority of life is to avoid getting the virus at all costs. So that perspective affects all decisions, even whether you go shopping or not. It affects your socialising. What are we supposed to do or allowed to do? Even when we go for a walk and we see somebody coming towards us, then we have to think of what to do and how not to get too close. So there's a challenge, isn't it? Our whole life is coloured by this thing. At least that's the temptation. And then we're tempted to be discouraged, aren't you? The things you want to do, you can't do them. Actually, things you plan to do, and you've had to shelve the plans. Many of us can't get out. We can't see loved ones. We can't take the holidays we wanted. And so the challenge becomes not to complain about what's going on and even not to murmur against God. And that's why we're turning to Philippians, and especially chapter 1, in three uh, things I want to bring to you, because this letter was written from where? From his living room by the fire? In prison. And you could be quite sure that prisons in those days not quite as comfortable and as pleasant as perhaps prisons can be today. Probably in Rome. 
But why was Paul in prison? Was he a criminal? Had he rebelled against the Roman authorities? No. Paul had been maliciously, falsely accused when he was in Jerusalem of taking Gentile companions into the temple where Gentiles, non-Jews, were forbidden. You can read that in Acts chapter 21, verse 28. He was almost killed by the mob. He was rescued by the soldiers, but then kept in confinement for at least two years. That's a mighty long time, isn't it? We've not had a year yet of our sort of semi-confinement. And he wasn't getting justice at the hands of those who were there for justice, the governors, Felix and Festus. They were corrupt. So finally, Paul appealed to Caesar in Rome because as a Roman citizen, he had that privilege of being heard at Caesar's tribunal. You can read that in Acts chapter 25 and verses 10 to 12. But poor Paul, was there ever such a missionary like Paul? But here, he's been confined to a cell, not able to use the gifts that God has given him. Now you can see there's a formal similarity between Paul's situation and ours. He was not able to do what he had planned. He planned to go to Rome and then to Spain, but certainly not by way of two years of languishing in prison. So this is our question this morning, my friends. What did Paul do? What did Paul think when his plans failed? And our privilege this morning is to imitate the servant of Christ, Paul, as he imitated Christ himself. And there are three things that we'll bring out today, tomorrow, and in two weeks' time, God willing. Here's the first answer to the question, what to do when your plans fail? Rejoice in new opportunities. Rejoice. Instead of moaning that he couldn't go to Spain as he planned, Paul saw in his changed circumstances the gospel advance you can read that then in verse 12 i want you to know brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel and this in two ways first of all to non-christians in prison paul had new and great opportunities for the ministry of the gospel. It seems like the Philippians, he heard this from their, their pastor, it seems that they were moaning, discouraged that this great apostle had uh, been confined to prison and that his work for God had been hindered. And surely the impulse was to pray. Possibly they did pray, I don't know. Lord, get him out of prison as soon as possible so he can start preaching again. But that's not the way Paul looked at it, is it? There's no prayer request like that in the letter to the Philippians. Here in Rome, we assume, he's guarded by what's called the imperial guard. The bodyguard of the emperor now, we don't know the exact circumstances, but you can imagine a soldier or two, perhaps he's even chained to them by both hands. That would happen. He has a captive audience, doesn't he? For hour 
after hour. What an opportunity. Sooner or later, the subject would come up. Paul, why are you here? What, what have you done wrong? Well, his mouth would open, wouldn't it? And he would speak about his faith in Jesus of Nazareth. His crucifixion, his rising from the dead, his coming to judge the world. That is what he preached to the governor. He would be able to say it wasn't for criminal activity or political rebellion, but it was, as it says here in verse 13, for Christ. As his friends came in to visit him, perhaps bring, bring him food and clothing, the soldiers would hear him speak the wonderful fellowship between Paul and other Christians. It seems there were letters he dictated from Rome. I mean, here's one of them. They would hear the dictation. They would hear him pray. They were with him 24-7. And what they would see in Paul is a totally different kind of prisoner. A patient man. A kind man. Even a joyful man. Instead of cursing and condemning others. And so, you don't have to imagine it, it's right here. This became the stuff of talk as the guards went home. I guarded such an unusual prisoner today. And they would speak about what they heard from him. And there's no question, and is there? Verse 13, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, and there were thousands of them. And to all the rest, their families and others beyond, that my imprisonment is for Christ. One can imagine that there was at least one person in Philippi who, on hearing this letter being read, chuckled to himself. You know who that is, don't you? The Philippian jailer. Because he heard the gospel from the very same prisoner in Acts chapter 16. What a wonderful way for these guards, these jailers, to hear. You might ask, how else would they hear unless it was from a prisoner? And so you see what God has done, don't you? God has shut one door. We think that's the right door, but Paul says no. He's opened this door to me, and it's been such a fruitful one. And that's what God was constantly doing in Paul's life. You see it especially in the second missionary journey. Paul wants to go to a certain place and God, we don't know how, but God closes the door. So he's forced that direction. That door is closed. He's forced that direction till finally he gets to Troas. Why? Because actually God wants him to get to Philippi. And so he has that a vision of the man of Macedonia saying, come over and help us. God is closing the doors so that Paul goes where he wants him to go. So that's the first way the gospel is advanced. May I just add that uh, someone in their writing has surmised it's guesswork but one can imagine it, that this Praetorian Guard were the, the crack elite troops who from time to time would be sent to all different parts of the empire. You've only got to imagine that some of them were Christians. Did some of them even come to Britain, for example? Well, I mean, Romans were here, weren't they? What God can do that we never would have imagined 
through one prisoner restricted in a Roman cell. But more than that, the gospel has advanced not amongst non-Christians only, but amongst Christians, amongst the church there in Rome, because we read in verse 14 that their witness was emboldened. So we read most of the brothers, that means the church members in Rome. They become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They heard themselves about Paul's boldness in speaking to the Praetorian guard. They would hear about the trial. Maybe there were many times that Paul had to speak, we don't know. What we do know is what we think is a later trial which, where he was actually put to death. His last letter, 2 Timothy and uh, chapter 4, this is what he does write. He says, verse 16, At my first defence, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. And then verse 17, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. Paul took his defence as an opportunity to preach the gospel to these Gentiles. Indeed, the Lord had appeared to Paul and told him, you are going to witness for me in Rome, not behind a pulpit in a public square, but at the bar of Caesar's tribunal. And then Christians looked at that and they said, if Paul the prisoner, under threat of death, can be so bold, why not me? Possibly at this time, Rome was under the shadow of that tyrant, Emperor Nero. But they were emboldened to speak the word without fear. You know the story many decades ago in the 1950s. The five men from America went to the jungles of Ecuador to preach the gospel to an unreached a group of people and they were killed. And you might think that those back in America, young people who were thinking of uh, missionary service would say, not me. That might happen to me. It had totally the other effect, so I read. For the next 10 years, from the college that they came from, Wheaton College, and uh, other uh, places, more and more people said, I want to give my life in service for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it does, doesn't it? That's what Christian biography does for you, doesn't it? That's what reading the scriptures about Stephen and about Paul does. God, you gave them boldness. Give me the same boldness. At least that's what Paul says was the effect of his imprisonment. My friends, that's the way to look at Paul's change of plans. It was for the advance of the gospel. So I want then to say to you this morning that my dear Christian friends, this is a great principle, the great principle, that all that happens is in God's overruling purpose for the advance of the gospel. And it's not just for apostles, but it's for all of us. We all live under chapter 1 and verse 6 of Philippians, where it says, He who began a good work in you 
will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Who's begun to work in you when you became a Christian? It's God, isn't it? And he's continued to work and he's going to continue to work until the end. As one person has written, the fire that we undergo, the trials in our Christian life, that fire is the fire of the refiner, God. God is in total control of our lives for good. He's not leaving that work to others. He uses others, even the devil. But God is in control. Any fire that comes is for a purpose, to advance the gospel. If Paul was ever asked the question, Paul, why are you in prison? There's no question what his answer would have been. I'm in prison because Christ wants me to be in prison. That's the attitude. So I'm saying to you, what really matters in your life is the advance of the gospel. Your focus must not be on what happens to you, whether it's unjust imprisonment, like Paul, whether it's persecution at work, whether it's financial trouble, or whether it's sickness. Don't focus upon those things by themselves. When your situation changes, when there's a trial, ask yourself, how can this new situation advance the gospel? I find it very encouraging myself when somebody prays for one who is sick or in a difficult situation. Instead of praying, as I'm afraid, too often happens, God, remove it. The prayer is, Lord, use this trial that my sister, my brother might grow in grace and be, be more useful in your service. Please help him or her to be a, a witness for you. Bring people whom you've prepared that they can hear the gospel. I want to give you a personal example, although I'm a bit frightened to do so, because I don't want to parade myself, but this was of the, the providence and grace of God. Six years ago, I had a serious operation when I was in Nairobi, Kenya. I was able to witness to a nurse because uh, the male nurse thought I needed some comforting after my operation and so just stood there behind me. It was a wonderful opportunity. There was a Congolese businessman in the bed sort of diagonally opposite me. A strapping young man, but was like a baby because of the uh, trouble going through. So there was an opportunity. Opposite me was an Ethiopian soldier who, according to what he told me, was the sole survivor of a tank attack. He was in the, in the Unison forces in Somalia and the tank had been bombed. He alone of the 20-odd people survived. Of course, I left them behind when I left hospital. But one man was brought in, in bed, I think it was 26, next to me. He'd been in a bus that had been bombed by the terrorists. A number of people died. And there he was with his legs injured, his in traction. He was a captive audience. Tony got saved. And he's now a pastor in Kisumu. All the glory is to God. But without me being there, humanly speaking, these people wouldn't have heard the gospel, would they? Tony can even say, thank God for the bomb. 
I'm quoting his words because of what God did through it. That's the way we've got to look at situations. Again, as somebody has written, our own comfort, our bruised feelings, our reputations, our misunderstood motives, they're all insignificant compared to the advance of the gospel. Now, what am I saying? Is it wrong to aspire to do well in your job, to uh, go through the ranks, get promotion? It's not wrong. But it depends why you want it, doesn't it? If you want it for your own luxury, then where, my friend, is the advance of the gospel? I couldn't have served 40 years in Kenya unless there were people who were able to support me there. If God blesses you financially, how is that going to be used for the advance of the gospel? Is it wrong to get married? Of course not. But why? How is your marriage going to advance the gospel as you labour together? Is it wrong to travel? No. But why? Does that have anything to do with advancing the gospel? Do we somehow, when we're on holiday, we're not Christians anymore? Oh, the number of people you meet when you go on holiday. What an opportunity. We who are older would love to see our grandchildren. We'd like to see that there are grandchildren and then see them. But why? Is it just like the world? Or is it because we want to have a gospel influence in their lives? Now I'm trying to be practical. So I ask you then, what does the advance of the gospel have to do in your life? As a Christian, you look for gospel opportunities in all situations that come to you because you know that all your circumstances, even those chance meetings, so-called, they're from the Lord, aren't they? And his program is his kingdom to come. So, is that what you're longing for? Is that what you're praying for? Have you ever thought that the pandemic, the lockdown, whatever your personal thoughts are about it, that's quite irrelevant. The fact is, it's with us. Have you ever thought that it's an opportunity for the advance of the gospel? It's not that we long for it to be over so we can get on with our work. May I give you some suggestions? Of course, the internet is now uh, really there, isn't it, in uh, many more lives. How can we use the internet for good? Before I came here, I worshipped with the brethren in Nairobi on YouTube. Now I'm here. What an opportunity we have, not just to receive, but to give. Some people are more open, aren't they? Because of what's taken place this year. You have more time. Many of you. The way you cope with the pandemic and the lockdown your trust in the Lord, your joy in all circumstances is quite different from the world and is a wonderful testimony to the grace of God as people watch you. Or have you just been bemoaning the restrictions? Perhaps some of you think they're unfair. Maybe they are. But you've not sought to make use of the opportunities. What do you do 
when your plans fail? Rejoice in the new opportunities that God gives. And I use the word rejoice because that's what Paul uses in verse 18, isn't it? When Christ is proclaimed, even some were doing it out of envy, I rejoice in that. That thrills the heart of the Christian. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, it can only be because the gospel is not that important to you. This gospel is about our Lord Jesus Christ, who came from heaven, who humbled himself to be born as a helpless baby. He began life as a man like ourselves. Then he lived. He lived a life of suffering, a life of persecution, till finally he was nailed to the cross. He died for our sins. He who was rich became poor for our sakes. That's what the gospel is about. Then he rose from the dead. Doesn't that mean everything to you? If our Saviour could do that for me, how is it that I can't give my life to serve him in all the opportunities that he gives to me? If, my friend, if the gospel of Jesus Christ has saved you so that you have eternal life, you have the greatest possible gift that can be given life with God forever in glory. Aren't you interested in the advance of that gospel? So that you pray, God, help me in this trial. Help me in this difficult situation that I'm going through. Help me in life. Help me in death. That I might be used of you to advance the gospel. Well, let's pray together, please. We thank you, our Father, for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, born, crucified, risen from the dead, exalted at your right hand. Forgive us, Lord, that we have become so familiar with it. Too often we've taken it for granted. We pray now that through your word, you'll help us, to each one, to look at our different circumstances and to see how the gospel can be advanced and to rejoice in those opportunities that you give to us individually and to us as a church. And we pray, Lord, in your great mercy, through all that's going on, the gospel might be advanced. Your kingdom might come and you might be glorified. Hear us as we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn about the love that God has for us. We can stand to sing, please.
Let us pray. We pray, O Lord, that you might be with us as we part. Continue to speak to us, we pray. Grant that we might not be hearers only, but also doers of the word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, whom you give to your people, that we might do what you say. May your grace and your love and your fellowship, triune God, be with us now and forever. Amen.